Hello and welcome to another episode of the Money Gains Podcast. This is your host, Sammy Alar King, and this podcast is powered by Up The Gains, which is a personal finance website dedicated to helping people like you and me learn about money safely. Now, today, my guest is Ben Vickers, who is a product manager at Wombat. Wombat are wicked. I downloaded them a few months ago myself, and I've been playing around with the app. I love the user experience and how easy it is to get into investing. So if you're listening on YouTube, please do hit the subscribe button. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, then please do whack the follow. It really does help the show. So let's get started on the Money Gains Podcast. The Money Gains Podcast, the financial guide, all green, no red. Yeah, we're the Money Gains Podcast. Let's make some bread for the 20. So, Ben, welcome to the Money Gains podcast, man. How's it going? You well? Very good. Thank you. Lovely to be here. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Thanks for asking. Thanks for asking, man. I am really excited to talk to you today. It's going to be a good episode because I downloaded Wombat uh, quite a while ago to, you know, when we wrote our review on it and I was hooked. I loved it from day one. I thought the, the user experience and for beginners especially was was incredible and the way that you're approaching it, you know, providing beginners a really great place to come and invest, but equally more experienced investors too, if they want to get into it. Um, So I think it's going to be a really interesting chat today. So we're going to be talking about you and Wombat Invest, but to kick things off, could you give the listeners a little bit of a spiel about who you are and your journey to date? Absolutely. So um, I'm Ben. I'm a product manager at Wombat. I've been working with Wombat now for uh, I was having this conversation earlier, actually, uh, roughly five years. Um, so it feels like a long time now. But uh, so, yeah, um, I suppose my history, I was in a previous life. A, um, I worked in a development agency um, in various roles. And Wombat was one of my first major clients. So when it was some scrawlings on a on a napkin, just an idea at that point, uh, I was, in, I was in, involved in the team that we eventually built the initial idea, expanded it, and I was very fortunate eventually to move over and become a full-time Wombat employee. So, um, so yeah, I suppose that was, that's kind of how I've got to where I am now. Very grateful. It's a good journey. So you worked at the development agency before that. What did you study at school? Were you, were you into your money before this, or was it, was it kind of just a, a, a journey that sort of happened? Hmm. So growing up, I, my mum, I was um, I was an only child. Mum was a, a single mum for for a good part of my life, um, and my mum, uh, I suppose she 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 earned decent money. She was uh, you know she earned, she had a, a decent job, but obviously being by by herself, it was obviously to a certain extent difficult. But I suppose from my perspective, being quite young, I never kind of realised that. Um, I was, I mean, as an early child, I was, I mean, I'll say I, I was quite spoiled as a child um, to a certain extent. Anything that, you know, I wanted for Christmas and things. My Christmas list was, <laughs> in reflection, disgustingly big. Uh, you know, two, two A4 slides of anyone, anything anyone could ever want. Um, and I got most of it, which was equally embarrassing. But, I you know, in reflection now, I see that, you know, that she was just trying to provide and give me the best life I could. But I think as a result of that, when I grew a little bit older, I didn't really have the value. I didn't understand the value of money to a certain extent. And then how that materialized was as I got to be a young adult going like into university, I was very materialistic and I wanted, I was very ambitious because I, in my mind, I needed a very good job to be really affluent so I could keep, keep spending and buying nice things and get a nice car and, a really nice house in Southern Italy or whatever it was. Um, <laughs> and it honestly, it's only been the last few years, probably slightly pre COVID or during COVID and, and kind of everything that went on after that, where, you know, for better or worse, COVID put me in a different part of financial position. I was very fortunate to be able to work through COVID and, you know, I didn't have the means to spend it in the same way I did before. And I just gained a different financial backing and I've, kind of had a word myself. I've kind of, you know, I've looked in 
I've looked in, in kind of my own motivations and my perception of things has changed now. And instead what I want is to build a backing, a comfort, like a, a safety blanket that I can build on in the future, eventually provide for a family. I can, um, I, I know life now isn't for me all about designer clothes and getting really nice cars and things like that. I just want to feel comfortable and I want to remove that stress of money in my life. So I suppose the end goal is still, I'd like to have as much money as I can in, in some respect, but I want, what I want to do with it is completely different. And I, I suppose I value the, the comfort it brings basically. That's lovely to hear you say that. So you had this kind of moment during COVID and that's when you was your, let's say your aha moment and you're like, right, new Ben, I'm going forward in this way now. Um, yeah, a lot. Of, I can relate to that a lot. You know, I was very much similar in my twenties and had that materialistic mindset. Um, mm. And it's just the way that I was brought up, similar to you. You know, yeah. was didn't want for things, and it doesn't install the value of the pound into your head. Into your head, and yeah, it, absolutely. You can go off on the pathway. Um, but mm. it's great to see that you know you're you're, you're moving forward and you you got some new long term goals. So. Um, talk to me about this kind of development agency you're in. What, what, what were you doing there? What wasn't I doing there? I was, so <laughs> I've had a very winding road to get where I am as most product managers have. If you, the more you speak to, you realize everyone's got to where they are in some really strange way. So I actually, before that worked in the NHS as a management graduate, as an operational manager, and I loved the management side of things, like the project management side of things, but yeah, despite me now having a really newfound respect for anyone who was involved in the NHS, um, I realized that that wasn't exactly where I wanted to be. So I've moved to a project management position up in, in York, which is really close to where I am in Leeds. Um, and it was something that I was inherently interested in, which was like tech. So that is the thing that throughout my life, I've always had an interest in. So started off as a project manager. We were involved in clients and businesses in every industry. So Wombat in like fin in the fintech space, we worked in like health tech space. We worked with schools and charities and big brands like Trainline and everything in between. So I had like a really eclectic um, experience there where you know, I was working with, you know, over 10 different clients in 10 different industries. Um, and it was fantastic for me because from, you know, from a now product manager, I had this really wide scope view of how everything ticks and what makes a good app or a good yeah. website good and what are things to avoid. Um, one back then kind of, you know, sunk its hooks into me. <laughs> and now I've kind of got the experience and the, and the view of everything. And now I hopefully can make that count in the, in the company I work for, which is great. So what does a product manager do? What, what, what does that mean? So in the simplest way of putting it, we are the voice of the user in the company. That's like the simplest way of putting it. So we focus on essentially two things. We want to solve user problems and add value to the user while um, facilitating all the things that make the business tick. So all of the business goals, we need to marry those things up. So in a little bit more granularity, we're speaking to users on a really regular basis, uh, either directly in surveys or just looking at the underlying data. Um, we understand where pain points might be happening or where we can add more value. And then by di with the direct conversations, we can say, okay, these people are typically going through this in their life or they're aiming to get here in the like, financial position. What can we do to facilitate that? What can we do to make that easier? So we'll, you know, we'll work closer with those people with a big wide group of people. And then we'll look to try and present that in the app that can get them from A to B, solving those problems, adding more values, and then facilitating the business goals. Wicked, that sounds super cool. So you're kind of like the the bridge between the commercial marketing business goals and the user really. So you're trying to kind of yeah. make that a seamless journey, feeding back the information that you're getting from the users into the team and then vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it, you know, sometimes it's, you skip the step of the user depending on the situation. Sometimes there is an opportunity and you can see how you could potentially solve a problem or create value with that. Um, and then that's when like the creative element comes in. And that's particularly why I thoroughly love my job um, is mm -hmm. because uh, I've got quite a creative family of artists and dancers and all these other things. And I think as soon <laughs> as I found my little niche in product 
I was like, oh, this is actually the thing that's been missing in all these previous roles because I can create something from nothing. And we always say it's like taking something from zero to one, which is a skill in itself and something you have to learn towards, but it's really rewarding doing that. And then seeing on the other side, it adds value to the user. It's just, it's just a really good job. It's, it sounds really cool. Um, what is there a big team? Are you part of a big team there? No, we're actually a really lean team. So we're, we're a startup, so we have to be economical. We have to try and do things as efficiently as possible. So we have many people wearing different hats to a certain extent. Um, so I like head up the product team. Um, at the moment, the headcount is, I suppose, two full-time product managers with people coming in and assisting in various parts of the flow. Um, right. But I suppose within the development, in the product team, we have full-time designers and business analysts and uh, members of the marketing team that assist with the, a lot of the research we do, and then a larger development team. So we've got lots of people running in and out of different kind of little subsections, so to speak. Um, but, you know, as a sign of the times, the way these kind of fin fintech and, and tech companies in general become successful is you, you try and keep the head count to a relatively lean amount, and then you have more runway and you can put more um, money into actually creating something that's valuable. So we just have to be efficient and until, you know, positions change, basically. I love what you said there, because a lot of fintech companies, they come in, they get the they get the capital, venture capital investment, yeah. and they hire the 100 people team, they go for it big time, they hemorrhage money, and then it doesn't take off. And suddenly they're left, you know, holding, holding the bag. And those... I think that's testament as well to when you go onto the Wombat app, which we'll get into in a short while, you can see the love and devotion that goes into the user experience and the way that it feels. And so it just makes you feel like it's run by people who actually know what they're doing and they're, they're, they're clearly <laughs> thinking ahead. And so to hear you say that internally that you think like that, you know, just kind of cements it all for me. So let's well, get I'm into that. I'm glad that. you're saying that because that is my job. So that means I'm doing something right at least. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Well, um, yeah, let's talk about Wombat then. Let's, uh, where, what is it and where does it come from? Yeah, so we've been, we've been kicking around now for a few years since um, uh, 2019, um, mid-2019. So it all started a long, long time ago. Uh, Kane, uh, one of our co-founders, who's, um, who's Australian, he uh, grew up in a fairly affluent, um, he had a fairly affluent upbringing. His father wanted to instill the same kind of principles he had. So uh, when he was like 15, 16, he encouraged Kane to go and get his first job, saved his first a thousand pounds, I think it was, or a thousand Aussie dollars, um, and then basically go and get exposed to the stock market. So he did that. That was kind of his initial investment journey. He then, you know, eventually went to university in Melbourne, came over to the UK and was working in um, investment banking um, with some of his new colleagues and friends he'd met over in the UK who was in a similar industry. Um, they were basically trying to find new investment opportunities for themselves um, and, and other things. Um, so, he, you know, he's had that kind of history of it. And then around a similar time when he was getting involved in, in that career, fractional shares came around. So I suppose what they are is long time ago, you, if you were looking to invest in a company, you had to buy whole shares. So take Tesla, for example, before the, the company split its price, it was trading for around 1200 US dollars a share. So if you want to invest in Tesla at all, you'd be investing at least, well, a thousand pounds, give you know, give or take the currency fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably close to like 1200 now um yeah but yeah so the fractional shares allow you to basically invest a, a much smaller amount and, odd, uh, and own a fraction of a share instead so you can invest as little as a pound in tesla basically theoretically and you get the same could be said true for for every stock and fund so basically this new trend came around and it was just the start of the time where um these types of uh, micro investment platforms were coming around and he just saw an opportunity there where the, the older kind of behemoth company, investment companies that were typically targeted at higher net wealth users um, who could afford to invest in these like whole um, shares. Kane basically combined his upbringing, the guidance his father gave him, and I suppose this new opportunity to reduce barriers of entry and make it something that's widely accessible. And that's kind of where the idea came from. He, he met Mike, our other co-founder, 
who um, had a very similar upbringing, weirdly enough. Um, and they just thought, Do you know, what? there's a gap there. There's something that we mm. can we can help mm. with. Um, so I suppose, yeah, that, that's kind of what kicked us off, basically. The rise of the retail investor, you know, people like me and you mm. has been you know, astronomical. It's huge. And so yeah, yeah. giving people access to the stock market by doing these fractional shares, you know, a lot of the old guard look down on it. But what it's done is changed the world of finance. Now, retail investors, as we've seen with like the Wall Street bets craze back in, yeah. in COVID, where, you know, people are making stocks from their bedroom do what you know the 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 institutions couldn't and yeah. uh, the power of that is insane and it's it's great to see that that they they believe that they could go out and create something like like mm -hmm. that and uh, so how long so they 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 they've come up with this idea what how long did it sort of take to get into fruition and the app to start sort of kicking on so obviously the idea kicked around for a little time and then when I worked for the development agency, it, it came eventually knocking on our door. Um, and, you know, make no bones about it. It takes a while to get something as complicated as a fully blown fintech app off the ground. You know, there's yeah. a lot of planning. You need to kind of you know dot the I's, cross the T's, fully understand exactly what you want to do and how you want to present yourself. And then, you know, you've got to go through designs. You've got to find developers. You've got to then start building it. And, you know, building an app of any scale is is awfully complex business. So we probably initially uh, started development um, in the back end of 2018. And like I say, we launched around July, 2019. So we were in development for like nine months. And then probably there was a, a further, say six to nine months before that of properly planning and getting everything sorted. Um, and then put initially post launch in 2019, it's just exploded. And, you know, the app is probably pretty unrecognizable from that point because it's more than double in size since we've got his own team and, you know, learn, listen to the customers and build exactly what they want. And what kind of products is it that one that offers? So we offer lots of things really. So we, the core of it is we offer some investment accounts. So we offer two different general investment account options and we offer a stocks and shares ISA. So stocks and shares ISA gives you the, um, the tax relief up to 20,000 pounds. Uh, and then the general investment accounts, um, you don't get the same tax relief as a uh, instant ISA, but a great place to get started. And you don't have to pay capital gains until a certain point. Um, and we have that bifurcated into two uh, like account options. So mm. we have like a what we call a standard offering, and then we have an instant offering. But in plain English, what we're basically doing there is creating an environment for a newer, less, in, less experienced investor to get started and then something for them to progress into or someone who is more experienced. Uh, we have an account type for them that has different tools and a slightly different feature set to facilitate everything they might want. Um, so like within the actual um, accounts themselves, we have like, obviously lots of functionality. We have um, over 30 curated themed funds, which we touch on slightly. Um, we've got over, how many at this point? I think probably over 500 curated us eu and uk stocks um we have uh, functionality being uh, roundups functionality which basically allows you to invest your spare change you make when you're making transactions like every day so you link it to like a bank account your card and as you go and go to the shop and buy your, your weekly grocery shop or you go to the cinema or you go for a, you know, a couple of drinks on a friday or whatever um Say that, that Friday round is seven pound fifty. It probably isn't nowadays, but seven pound <laughs> fifty. The extra fifty p to make that a whole pound is basically we um, like keep track of that and then basically take that back as a direct debit. So it's a really nice way of like invest or uh, saving, like our investing without actually realizing because they've got a lot of the roundups things. Like you know, you can, like McDonald's now, if you go and go through the drive through, you, it offers you to round it up. So there's that, and then there's the auto investments and deposits which basically do the same thing but more structured so you set the amount you want to save each month and then it'll invest it in all the different things you'd like to um we have a referral scheme so you can refer friends and both earn a reward from it um we have uh, different investment categories so you can basically help you understand 
uh, different investment opportunities, which are performing well, which aren't, which ones are paying dividends. And then I suppose the other thing that is, I suppose, a pretty standout thing for us is our learning hub. So yes. as you kind of mentioned around the structure of our accounts, we want to welcome people of any experience level. We were happy being your first investment journey. And to facilitate that, we have a learning hub, which is filled of learning uh, articles, um, how-to guides. Basically, we want to help you go from never invested in your life, not really not sure what you're doing, to eventually becoming somewhat of an expert. We want you to take you on that journey. And we have all that under under one hood. Um, you know, there's plenty of other things as well, but I suppose they're the key ones. Uh, and the learning hub and, and those things are, are what really critical to our mission and our, our values that I mentioned at the top of the call. That's why when I first logged in and started having a play around, the two things that struck me was the funds, which we'll touch on again in a sec, but the learning hub is excellent. Mm. And it's it just makes you feel safe. And, you know, mm. I've been investing for years, so, I, you know, I, I don't have those same worries, but I took myself out of the the frame looked at it from an outsider's perspective and the content within there, you can walk away from your phone as well. You don't need to do anything. You can literally sit there on your phone on your commute yeah. and learn um, all through the Wombat app without having to go anywhere. And I just thought that was yeah. brilliant. Um, and, you know, a lot of these other apps, they do have academies, but you have to log into the, to the web version. They're not mm -hmm. all uh, always accessible. Some of them are YouTube channels rather than in house. And you know, mm -hmm. I just, I just thought that housing everything in one place was, was a really, really great move. We'll just touch back on the funds because they're a yep. bit different to, um, to a lot, well, to end to most of the providers out there I've ever come across. So, you know, I love them. You've got the techie, the adventurer, and do you want to talk a little bit about those? Absolutely. So themed funds, you know, under the hood, what they are is a, is a fund, is an ETF, an exchange traded fund. And what that is in its, in its purest sense is a collection of loads of little companies and holdings, um, all within one wrapper. And then the, why these are quite attractive are that when you've got say 50 different companies within one holding, um, the price can change individually for those things, but it'll smooth out the volatility. So the intention is, that you're exposed to slightly less risk, um, depending which fund you select. Um, so it's somewhere <laughs> to kind of house your money for the, for the longer term, I suppose. Um, so what we did was we wanted to make that understandable because I'm not sure if you've seen like the name of just a normal fund. <laughs> it's just a bunch of letters and numbers and you don't really get much from it. You have to really research it. You have to see exactly how it's broken up and uh, most of these companies you've never heard of if you just picked a random one. So we were to make that understandable. We basically uh, curated funds that were in specific industries. Um, so you mentioned a few there. One of my favorite ones um, kind of happened back to my um, my materialistic kind of upbringing is the Fashion Easter. So it's like a high-end yeah. fashion fund. So like Louis Vuitton and Gucci and all these um all these traded companies are all within this one fund um, and we've called it the fashionista. So, you know, we haven't necessarily manipulated the fund in any way. We've just given it a name. We've given it an image that is understandable. And that is what we're actually trying to achieve. We're, we're trying to make it understandable and um, the user can associate themselves with it. So what we found yeah, exactly. in our like, research and for me as well, because before Wombat, I wasn't an investing expert. This is something that I've grown to have a passion of, but, you know, when I got started and I started seeing these funds and we were discussing the concept of them, um, you start investing in one and then you're exposed to the market and then you can see, okay, I'm going to put £10 in this and see what happens. And that £10 goes to £10.50. So you put in another £10 and you start growing it and then you've got it in for a few months and it's you're up 10% and you're like, okay, I understand how this works now. And then it might go down and you're like, okay, right, this is normal. This is why it's happened. And it's just a really good entry point to, mm. to understand the behaviors of the market. And, you know, it's not just an entry point. I have funds in my portfolio now that I've had for like two years and that um, are made up of like tech giants um, that are, mm. that's performing like really well. But it's just, a, it's just a really nice way of getting started. And we just want to take the edge off the intimidation that kind of goes around with investing because I think there's, a, there's like a nuance around investing. And understandably so, because you are risking your own money to a certain extent, is um, we need to make it a little bit, we need to remove some of the jargon. 
make it a little bit more understandable and give people a place to start because that is ultimately what we want to do. We want, we want to help people start their investment journeys. So, um, yeah, from what we've seen and when we've spoken to people, it seems like it's working. So, yeah, that, that's one of the many things, but it's, um, it's definitely, I'm proud of having it on the app for sure. What I love there is that, you know, when I talk to people and they say, how on earth do I start investing? Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I'll say to them is if they want to be an individual stock picker is just look around your house and, and what do you buy and what do you yeah. associate yourself with? And that's often a really easy way. You can go and I can 20, you know, 20 seconds, I can go and write 30 products down. Um, and you'll start to see, you know, correlation between, all right, cool. I, you know, I like, I like my high end fashion or I like my tech or, yeah. you know, I like my cars, whatever it is, then you can then come on to one bat and relate that and have a really good crafted fund made by, you know, BlackRock is, has a lot of them, right? And yep. which is you know, one of the biggest investment firms in the world. So you can, you have the trust there that you're in good hands and, and you're mm. immediately associating yourself with you, with your investment, which I, I personally believe is how people will stay motivated and stay doing it. You know, mm. if, if yeah. they have a bad year or something goes wrong, if they're invested in these companies, cause they like them mm. and it makes mm. a big difference, right? Yeah, and what, what I found is that when you're passionate about something, you tend to just know more about it as well. So yeah. like, you know, for me, I've got lots of different interests. And when I was getting started, a bunch of these things, you know, I follow a bunch of different accounts and influence things on Twitter, for example, or Instagram. And you just start picking up little bits and bobs, or you might be reading the news and you might just pick out something because you're interested in it. And without really knowing, you've kind of built this like knowledge base of things you care about. And then when you come to invest it, like, oh, that makes sense because I know this and the other, I know the kind of, you know, it's just one of those natural things. You kind of pick things up without realizing and then giving people the opportunity to like put an action on those passions. It just makes sense. Why not make money out of it if you can? Completely agree. You, you mentioned as a T as well, in terms of your users that go on there, how, how many do you, you know, what's the kind of correlation between the people that individually stop picking the people that use funds? Is there any percentages? You can um, see? It completely depends on the user to be fair. We, we try and encourage it having both. So one of our, our key values as a, as a company, uh, one of the Keynes key values where our founder uh, when he was setting it up is we really wanted to allow people to invest in the long term, to invest regularly, and then to diversify. And it's that diversification that's really important. So funds do that inherently because there's a collection of different um, uh, companies. But we try and promote in a lot of our articles that having a widespread of um, different uh, companies and funds within different industries, basically exposed to different pressures that might be going on with the world, you uh, you reduce your kind of overall risk. If you've kind of got all your eggs in one basket, in one industry basket, and something really negative happens, you can be exposed to all that risk. So um, we try and encourage everyone to do that. And we, we do see that. We see that um, funds are really well uh, taken up as our individual stocks across the different markets. And I, I'm, I'm, I like to believe that that's because a lot of the uh, learning material put out there and a lot of the, I'd say investment categories we do to, to promote a lot of those different things that are performing well or not so well. Your app developer deserves a, a pat on the back because the <laughs> user experience is, is wicked. Like you can get to where you need to get to quickly. Everything is super visual, which, you know, in the past with some investment apps has been really difficult to navigate and understand what the hell's going on, but you've made everything and you've placed things and on the page in a way that is really, it makes it fun. It is quite fun to use that app, which is rare. Um, especially when with an investing app for sure. And, um, you know, what, what do you feel like is the next phase for Wombat? Is there any nuggets you can give us? <laughs> um, in short, there's lots of things we're working on. <laughs> it's like a super exciting. Had to try, had to try, man. I know. Well, um, <laughs> I, I can get, I can give something because I suppose my, when I'm typically asked like what my favorite feature is, I would say it's the like alt investments and roundups. And I can explain why in a second, but that's maybe shifting because we're, work, we're about to work on something or we're in development with something that um, I absolutely love, like how we've executed it. And that's uh, um, real time alerts for price changes and news articles. Right. And this is the first, like our first iteration of this and it will expand and grow 
um, over the coming months. But essentially what that'll mean is we can give people uh, real-time information as stocks and, and funds um, shift price to a, cer to a certain extent. So if, mm -hmm. if Apple goes up 5% within a certain time frame, you will be the first to know that that's happening. And then on top mm -hmm. of that, we will give you an article that exp that'll, um, so if, if that price fluctuation is due to something that's going on, that's potentially newsworthy, you will also receive a news article that explains why, or explains kind of what's going on within an industry or within a certain company. So you just, you feel really in the know, like I say, we're, we're yeah. in development with this. So it's not exactly ready, but it's going to be ready really soon. Um, and seeing all the prototypes and exactly how we're going to build it. It's just, it's just really good. It's really exciting. And it's, um, it's kind of a way of, of kind of upskilling our users. And I think you can probably read into that with a lot of the things I mentioned. And that's, it's not just giving you people a platform to, to invest. It's about upskilling them, either upgrading their financial backing themselves or upskilling, upskilling their knowledge base to understand how to get more out of the savings they do have. Um, so yeah, but you know, that's just one nugget probably cause it's really nearly <laughs> fresh off the press. Hot off the press there. Thank the you. Hot off the press. That's an <laughs> exclusive screen. Um, but there's, there's a lot. So we, um, we've kind of really turned the screw with a bunch of things we're working on. Um, you know, and I think the next six months are going to be extremely exciting. Um, yeah, it's really good to see what we're, we're producing. And we have, as you mentioned, we have a, an absolute stellar design team and a stellar development team and, um, I know what they're going to produce. It's going to be top of class. So, yeah, you can see the love, and that's uh, that's you know it's evident across the app for sure. So, what you mentioned about the roundup feature there—that was you know, one of your favourite bits. Uh, did you want to touch mm -hmm. on that? Yeah. So, I mentioned it at the start as well. The reason why I love it is because it just it just works in my life. So, when you say as a product manager, how you know you're producing something that you actually is is good is when it's something that you actually want to use. And mm. they are things that it's very difficult now for me to imagine not using them. I think as most people are now, like now, like today's age, everyone is, most people are inherently lazy. They want things to be done for them to a certain extent. And, you know, I'm no different from that. Um, and <laughs> like the auto investments and roundups, basically I just set up at like a, a couple of years ago now, I basically did some research and I identified a bunch of different funds and stocks that I thought, okay, I think there's a good opportunity here. Um, this and the other, I built them into my portfolio. I basically started off and I had like a hundred pound going in a month, um, as an auto deposit. So I set it up as a direct debit, never thought about it again and broke, broke that down into all these different investment in, in different stocks and, uh, funds, um, that I like the look of. And then I basically forgot about it. And six months later, um, it was going really, really well. So then I went from 100 to about 250 and then basically looked at different things. I took a couple out that weren't, that weren't performing too well, or I thought we're going to kind of reach a bit of a peak soon and then visit on the other. Um, and I'll say that as I was kind of doing this, when I came to doing the research, it was only because of the performance and like starting to get excited because I was making like my portfolios up like 10%. I was like, this is amazing. I've just made like 10% <laughs> over like, you know, six, six months of a hundred pounds. I've made an extra like 60 quid for doing nice. nothing. Like it's money that would have just gone into my account, into my savings account that I usually would siphon a little bit for an extra night out a month or something. And now instead <laughs> I'm kind of, it's keeping me well, it's keeping me well behaved because it's like not in my account ready to spend immediately at least. And, um, and I can just kind of set and forget it. And I've never looked back from there. And it's, that's been like really like pivotal to just, to me is like how I now live my life. Like I just have, you know, when you, when you look at your start of your month and you're budgeting, you look right, this is going to, my car's going to come out that much, my rent, my bills, you know, this and the other, I need this much amount for food shops. And then without thinking, I now have X amount that goes into my one back account. Um, and that's just part of my life yeah. now. That's part of my savings. And then. You know, like last year went on a really nice holiday and I took some out, but instead of just taking out your savings where you don't really think about it, I'm now thinking, well, if I take that out and then, you know, all these things go up another 5%, it's not only the money I'm taking out, I'm actually losing out on the potential 5%. So it's like, it's just this, 
this switch that changes in your head and you just appreciate the journey a lot more and the value yeah. of it. And um, that's why I love those things. But I do think the new alerts functionality is going to potentially compete with it because it's going to, it's just going to feel like I have a stock market in my hand, which is going to be really cool. Um, but between those things, I'd say they're my favorite, I'd say. I love that though, what you said, it, you know, it doesn't have to be with Wombat. It's about the habit and mm. the, you set it up, you didn't look at it. You came back in a, in a six month time and were really pleasantly surprised yeah. to see that it's gone up. But what you had done is you'd forgotten about it. It just became part of your monthly budget. You exactly. set it and you forget it. And then once you're, you know, they say it habit takes three, four months to, mm -hmm. to really kick in or three, four times of doing something for it to really kick in. And so mm -hmm. you, you, you were over that period and then you're away and actually then yeah. you become really, really interested in it. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah. you know, I'll sell this or maybe I'll buy this. Cause I, you know, and you start thinking like that. Exactly. And it, it's yeah. amazing how the journey changes. Like my other half, Charlotte, she, um, she, she loves, it now she's literally asking me she's like how's how's my account doing how's my account doing? <laughs> what, what do we need to do because i saw this in the news and now i'm thinking about this and so yeah. uh, honestly if you put her in the room she'd be the last person to think about this type mm. of stuff but we've set her up she direct debits 150 pounds in each month and now she's like wants to put it up because she's like yeah. in and it, it changes in people and you know you it, you were just talking about that journey there and i, I love it man well, the, the best, the best example for this is going back to my mom. Um, and when we first launched it, uh, I think my mom, this shows how you know, proud, proud mom she is. I think she's the 35th user on one bar ever. So oh, cool. she was <laughs> the second it was available. She was scrambling to get it downloaded. And, um, you know, when I started it, doing the auto investments and, and getting it set up, um, and so, you know, it, it was going well, you know, a few months and it'd be like down and you'd be like, okay, this isn't panic stations. This is why this is happening. But if you're in it long enough, you could hopefully see it come out, but you can under, it just helps you understanding and experience with it. And my mum did the same. Um, she could afford to put a little bit more in than I could. And she basically did the same thing. She had like a, an, a collection of different funds and stocks left it for so long. Um, and now like about a year ago, she started her own business. Um, funny enough, she, she basically built a spa in her, in her garden. She's got a, quite a bit of land. It's really, when she pitched it to me, I was like, it seems a bit odd, but it, it went really well. It's going really well. But um, she was basically only able to do that because of the money she'd basically saved from Wombat. So she basically right. put all this money aside every month and got it to a point where she was, she knew she had that nest egg there. And then when the time come and she was, you know, discussing with my stepdad being, you know, I want to do this. I think we can do it. And then they're like, oh, but you know, you're coming out of this job and you know, we earn this much money. And if we take that away, it's going to be difficult. And then she's like, but we've got this, which, which buys us, you know, like three or four months. Um, and we can afford to do it. We can afford yeah. to take the risk. And if she wouldn't, if she hadn't have done that four four years ago or so now, I don't think she'd be in the position she is now where she's got this really successful business and it doesn't always work out that way, but it just goes to show that, you know, if you can budget properly and that's like I say, that's with one, but or without one, but if you can just budget properly and understand your incomes and outcome and, uh, and incomes and outgoings, and you can be sensible and you can most importantly be exposed to the stock market for the long term. It's not about short term gain. It's for the long term and riding out waves of volatility and things that go on in the world that, you know, it's crazy right now. You know, you should come out on the other end with something that otherwise you wouldn't have had. Um, mm. And that's my that's my favorite like testimony with that because it, it's just nice that you know I don't well, I shouldn't take credit for this, but I feel like in a weird way, like <laughs> that biz that business is basically mine is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Oh, don't let me hear you say that. No, no, I'm, I won't be sending a link to this podcast. Don't worry. <laughs> well, what I love though, mate, about what you said there was a really, really good point. Um, apart from the fact that you're part owner of your mom's business, <laughs> is that uh, she used the money, and yeah. like that's what I think people think like oh you know it's for retirement it's for retirement That's, that can be further from the truth if you're if you're saving mm. for a house deposit if you're saving for 
you know, a new car or something that is going to provide value to your life. That is why you're mm. investing. So it, the goal yeah. doesn't have to be a comfortable retirement. The goal can be to big life purchases. And I, I, this Absolutely. changed my mindset where a friend of mine, um, he turned around and said, well, yeah, I'm going to buy this house that I wanted to, mm. to buy. And I'm like, oh, right. Oh, okay. What well, you're going to take your money out of your investment? He said, oh, yeah, damn right. I am. I'm going to take the money out of here because I don't want to have this bigger mortgage and I want to use the money mm. and I want to get the make, make my payments easier. And I was like, oh, yeah. sh you know, makes a lot of sense really actually. And your mum did the mm. same. So you know, I think that's important and people to realize that it's not just necessarily the goals that yeah. are like 30, 40 years ahead. It can be for something that's, that's a little bit quicker on the well, horizon. You yeah. You still have access to it. And it, it's not like putting money into Elisa, for example, where you kind mm. of locked off or like a, you know, help to buy scheme. It's like, and you know, when I was putting the money in every month, I mean, there were, there were times, you know, where you have those months where it just seems to be like everybody's birthday all within like two mm -hmm. weeks. It's like, what was mm -hmm. going on? Like, why do I have so much outgoings? But, and you know, in those times I would sell a few things down and I would withdraw it back and that would just help me. But I had that buffer there and you know, the, if I could afford it, you know, when I got paid again, I'd be like, right, I'll, I'll put in an extra. 60 quid because I took a little bit out this time and I'll top it back up. If I couldn't do that, oh, well, that's just the nature of life. Like it's not perfect all the time. Um, but that's what it is. And, you know, depending on which account you can be on, if the market's open, you can sell down and the money can be in your account within five minutes. So it's like, yeah, it's not yeah. like it's this locked it's away. There. Yeah, it's there. It's just a, it's just another account on a, you know, not on your banking app, but in one back. So. But if you don't touch it and you do keep adding to it too, then, you know, then it's going to yeah, go yeah. up over time. It will. It's just hopefully. The yeah. That's the intention. Designed. Yeah. But if Unless you World War History, III kicks off. Goes. Yeah. Well, never say never. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get that one. Um, <laughs> and it's been a real big pleasure to act, chat into you. I've absolutely loved it. Um, Me too. What's the, um, what's the next, you know, if people want to check out one that, where can they go and, um, what's the best next steps for them? So, um, go to the app store, the Apple app store or the Google play store, um, type in one bat or one bat invest. We should be pretty high, uh, for both even, even one bat you'd be surprised here because there's lots of one bat apps, weirdly enough. <laughs> um, or just go to uh, your normal search engine, Google or whatever you use and just type in one bat invest. And from there you can, um, you can download a link and you can, uh, you can create an account from downloading the app to having your investment account in less than three minutes. So it's wow. super simple. And then basically you can get straight in and start checking it out and starting your investment journey, basically. Wow. That's amazing. We'll leave a link as well in the show notes for anybody that wants to, to check that out here while they're in the app. Um, but yeah, Ben, thank you so much. Um, really thank enjoyed this me. and, uh, yeah, look forward to getting you on in a couple of years and talking about how the, you know, Wombat's taken over the investing game. Brill. I look forward to it. All right, man. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.